morning, Isaiah, who saw the cross 750 years before it ever happened. Our subject this morning is the substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And our scripture is found in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 7. It's our custom here to stand together in honor of the reading of God's Word as we have a congregational reading of the Scripture. The Scriptures are printed in your book. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Truly, he had worn our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so open he not his mouth. Thank you. Be seated, please. This morning I would like to first give you a picture of substitution in Genesis chapter 22. And then speak to you about what kind of a death Jesus died. And then, thirdly, the shells of Isaiah 53.11. And then, fourthly, answer six questions about the death of Christ. I'm concerned about the fact that most Christians know very little about what transpired on the cross of Calvary. They know Jesus died on the cross. They know He died for our sins. But they know very little about what was required of the Lord to fulfill His mission as a Redeemer. And I want to bring out some of those things this morning. First, in Genesis chapter 22, you'll recall how Abraham received a call from God. Abraham, take thy son thine only son Isaac, and offering for a burnt offering on the mount which I shall show thee off. And Abraham dutifully saddled up the animals, took his son Isaac, went up on top of Mount Moriah to prepare to offer his son as a sacrifice to God. And that mount on which he took Isaac is the very spot on which Jesus died on the cross. As he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him upon the altar, kindled the fire under the wood, then raised his knife to take the life of his beloved son Isaac in obedience to the commandment of God. And as he brought the knife down, the angel of God caught his wrist and said, Abraham, do thy son no harm. Now I know that thou lovest me. Look yonder in the thicket. And as he looked there in the thicket was a male ram that is a large 
male sheep caught in a thorn bush. The thorns were penetrating his jaws. He could not back out of the bush. And God said, take that ram and offer him in the stead of Isaac as an offering. So Isaac lived because a substitute died in his place. The ram died in Isaac's place. So Isaac lived. We live because a substitute died in our place. That substitute was the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And that wonderful scripture in the 13th verse of Genesis 22, and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns, and Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. In the stead of his son. That is, in the place of his son. The ram became a substitute. Isaiah wrote these words in Isaiah 53. 750 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. 750 years before the cross ever took place. Isaiah wrote about it. In great detail, he described the sufferings of our Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross. Verse 1 of Isaiah 53, to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? This is the bared arm. This is the arm where the sleeve is rolled up to undertake a mighty undertaking. Yep. Creation of the heavens and the earth was only his finger work. But the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Talmadge, the great orator and preacher said, when God created the universe, He didn't even half try. But when He undertook the task of redemption, it required His bared arm. It was the greatest undertaking that God ever undertook. The redemption of His people was greater than creation, greater than anything else. God had ever done. And Isaiah in chapter 53 brings before us that marvelous and wonderful account of how the Son of God gave Himself as a sacrifice for our sins. What happened at the cross? He was on the cross for six hours from 9 o'clock in the morning until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He hung on the cross, under the blazing sun, thirsty, wounded, weak, suffering. And the Bible says in John 19 and verse 18, where they crucified Him, and two other with Him, on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. Now Jesus did not die a martyr's death. He did not die as a social worker for the community. He did not die as an example for us to follow. He did not die as a politician for a political cause. Jesus died to pay a debt. I have in my office a plaque on the wall and it says, Jesus died to pay a debt he didn't owe because I had a debt I couldn't pay. That's what Jesus did. What kind of a debt did he die? It was a penal death. A death of a felon. The death of a criminal. He was judged as a criminal, as a felon, as the off-scouring of the earth, as a nobody. And yet he was.
because the Son of the living God, the Creator of the universe, and the one who came to save those very men that crucified Him. What is the cross? What does it mean? Well, it means more than a piece of wood. You see, it's not that piece of wood that saves us. It's what Jesus did on that piece of wood that saves us. You can wear a cross around your neck. But that cross has no magical power. It'll do nothing for you. And that wooden cross, without the Son of God, hanging there, shedding His blood, would mean nothing. But what He did on that cross means everything to us. Because what He did on that cross was to offer Himself in death to pay our sin debt that we could not pay. Paul explains the cross in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul only had one message. Christ died for our sins. So what He did on the cross is our redemption. Without dying on the cross, there would be no hope for any of us. The Old Testament word for cross is staros. It's found 28 times in the New Testament. And the Old Testament word anomalous is the word for transgressors. He died in the place of transgressors. He took the place of transgressors to die for our sins. So what kind of a death did he die? He died a voluntary death. He said, no man taketh my life from me. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. No one killed Jesus. He laid his life down willingly as a sacrifice. Now their intent was to murder him, and they did. But his purpose was to give himself for us, a living sacrifice offering himself in death. So it was a voluntary death. Then it was a substitutionary death. Christ died for our sins. That word for is a very important word. It is hooper. And it means in the stead of or in the place of. So when he was dying upon the cross of Calvary, he was dying for me, in the place of me, who paired, taking my place. It was I who deserved the cross. It was I who deserved the nails. It was I who deserved the spear. But he took my place. I'm going to heaven someday because he took my place. My substitute. Is he yours this morning? Then he died a satisfying death. You see, there were some things he had to accomplish. First of all, as a sacrifice, he had to take care of the broken law. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Ten Commandments condemn us. The Ten Commandments, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not lie. That's the law of God. His moral law. And if you ever break one of those commandments, you have broken all ten. God holds you guilty of all ten if you break even one. Who among us has not broken the law of God? And for us to be saved from our sins 
and the awful penalty of our sins, Jesus had to keep the law perfectly. And for three and a half years during his ministry, he walked among men and said, Which of you convinces me of sin? For three and a half years, they watched him and they found no flaw in him. They found no fault with him. No one could let on a charge against him. He was holy, harmless, and undefiled. He had to satisfy the broken law that I and you have broken. And all of that beautiful life that he lived, he demonstrated that he was capable of satisfying the law of God for he never once broke it. Never once broke the law. He kept the Ten Commandments perfectly. Therefore, as my substitute and as my Redeemer, He could go to the cross for me and satisfy the broken law in my place. So then I am not guilty of the broken law, for my Redeemer kept it for me in my place so I could be free from the penalty of the broken law. Secondly, it was a satisfying death because the justice of God had been outraged by our sins. We had sinned against the holy God. And justice demands the death of the sinner. The justice of God demands a payment and the wages of sin is death. But Jesus paid that debt we owe. He faced the justice of God and said, I'm taking their place. Execute the justice of God upon me. I will take their place. I heard a story about a old preacher <clears throat> told this story. There was a boy and he liked to jump on his mother's feather bed. And she had just put the white clean feather bed all in shape and said, don't you go near that bed. And she heard a noise and she looked in and there was that boy jumping out of the window on her feather bed. And she got her whip and she got him by the arm and raised that whip. And that little boy's big brother, riding by on his horse, saw what was happening. And he jumped in through the window and said to his mother, don't whip him, whip me. You can whip me in his place. And with a tear in her eyes, she said, both of you get out of here now. <clears throat> On the cross, my muddy feet had defiled the holiness of God. And the rod of justice was raised. <clears throat> but before it could strike me, I learned that 1900 years ago plus somebody took my punishment for me. In the fourth place, it was a redeeming death. Jesus bought us out of the slave market of sin in order to set us free of sin. Fifthly, it was a limited death. I lay down my life for the sheep. He died for a people. He knows those people. He loves those people. And he gave his life for those people. Sixthly, it was a loving death. Jesus said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. It was a reconciling death. And you have to reconcile who were dead in trespasses and in sins. And then it was a suffering death. He suffered in body. 
He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. He suffered in body. He said on the cross, I thirst, hanging in the blazing sun with no water to drink, having been beaten all night. He said, I thirst. He suffered in body. Then he suffered in soul. For when he was made as an offering for sin, and the Father had to turn his face away from him, he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He suffered in his soul. Then he suffered socially. All men forsook him and fled. Then last of all, it was a propitiating death. Verse 25 of Romans 3 says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. That word propitiation is the Greek word holeskopei, and it means to turn away wrath. The wrath of God was against us. But when Jesus went to the cross, he turned away the wrath of God that was for us. He turned it away. He shielded us from it so that we would not suffer. There are four elements in the crucifixion that were necessary for Jesus to fulfill in order to provide an atonement for our sins. And they're all four in verse 11 of Isaiah 53. Let me read the verse. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall thy righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. First of all, there is the shall of a substitution. This word shall means purpose, certainty, necessity. The shall of a substitution. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. In the second place, there is a shout of justification. Verse 11, so shall my righteous servant justify many. What does justify mean? It means to be declared righteous. How can God take a sinner who has sinned against his holiness and righteousness, how can God take that sinner and declare him righteous and allow him to enter heaven? How can he do that? He does that through justification. By the imputation of the righteousness of Christ to the sinner, the sinner is justified from all sin. He stands before God with all of his sins forgiven, cleansed from all filth and in undoing. He stands righteous in God's sight because of his Savior. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. But God commandeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, Christ died for me before I ever knew him. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. 
saved from wrath. We deserve the wrath of God. But we're not going to experience the wrath of God, the anger of God, because Jesus experienced it in our place. Thirdly, he, there's the shout of realization. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. And my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. He bore our sins upon the cross. He shall see the travail of his soul. Travail like a child birth. When a mother goes through the most awful pain imaginable and labors to bring forth a child and trouble and pain and misery, but then the relief that a child is born into the world. Jesus saw the travail of his soul and was satisfied. None of the ransomed ever knew how deep were the waters crossed or how dark was the night that the Lord passed through ere he found his sheep that was lost. There's a shallow of satisfaction Verse 11, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. For my righteous servant shall bear their iniquities. That means paid in full. One day a man was stopped for speeding and the policeman wrote out a ticket gave him a speeding ticket. Said, now you'll have to go to the judge and pay this ticket, a $5 fine. However, we need blood at the Red Cross. And if you go down to the Red Cross, Red Cross and donate a pint of blood, they'll give you a ticket, stamp paid, and you won't have to appear before the judge. Well, five dollars was a lot of money in that day. He said, I'm going to give the pint of blood. He went down to the blood bank at the Red Cross, rolled up his sleeve and said, take a pint of blood. And they took a pint of his blood and then he handed them the speeding ticket and they stamped it, paid in full. And he never had to go with that ticket to the judge. And one day I heard the gospel. The gospel I'm preaching to you this morning. And Jesus reached down from heaven and stamped it paid in full in his own precious blood. What a redeemer. What a savior. What a God we have. That would take sinners such as you and I and save us from our sins and give us a new life. His death was an identification. It was for ours. Now, six questions. These are questions people have asked me over the years. What was laid on Jesus at the cross? What was transferred to Jesus? The iniquity of us all. The Bible says he hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. As the old black folks used to say, somebody's iniquity was taken off them and put on someone else. That's right. Our guilt, our punishment was taken off of us and put upon Jesus who took our place. The second question, who laid this iniquity on someone else? Verse 6 says, the Lord hath laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. It was God that did that. I couldn't lay my sins on Jesus. The preacher can't lay your sins on Jesus. The priest can't lay your sins on Jesus. 
The sinner can't lay his sins on Jesus. Only God can lay a sinner's sins on Jesus. And He did that at the cross 2,000 years ago for His people. For His people. If you're one of His people, He did that for you 2,000 years ago. And He wants you to know about it this morning. The third question. Upon whom was this iniquity laid? And it says, laid upon him. Placed upon him. As Jesus hung on Calvary's cross, God placed on him the iniquity, the sin of us all. The us is the people that He died for. Those who trust Him. The place of the Scripture that He read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. Like a lamb dumb and quiet before His shearer, so opened He not His mouth. Jesus never opened His mouth when he was on trial, an unjust trial, a trial for something that he never did. He never opened his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation or his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch answered Philip, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Jesus. He's the one. Fourth question. Where was this iniquity laid on Jesus? And when? And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified Him. What is this place? This is the same place that Abraham was going to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. Called Mount Calvary. But in Abraham's day, it was called Mount Moriah. And the fifth place. Whose iniquities were laid upon Jesus. All those who trust Him. His elect people will trust Him. Verse 12 says, Because He had poured out His soul unto death, and He was numbered with the transgressors, and He bare the sin of many, and made intercession with the transgressors. Whose iniquities were laid upon him? All the people that he chose before the foundation of the world. And if you choose to believe in him, then you will know you are one of those upon whom God laid all your iniquities upon Jesus. There are two kinds of people in the world today. Those who reject Him and those who accept Him. If you accept Him, then you know by His own word that He has accepted you. If you reject Him, then He rejects you. Today, right now, you can accept Him. You can receive Him as your personal Lord and Savior. And when you do that, by an act of faith, then you know that you're one of those who 2,000 years ago, Jesus laid your iniquity on Him. The many who are actually justified by Christ This is a sobering thought. If God 
did not lay your sins on Christ at the cross, He never will. Could I say that again? If God did not lay your sins on Jesus at the cross, He never will. And the only way you can know if He laid your sins upon Jesus at the cross is to trust Him, to receive Him, to repent of your sins and put your faith in Him. And if you do that, then you know you're one of those that He sent His Son to die for. You could receive Him today. The Bible says, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. And all that the Father giveth me, Jesus said, shall come to me. And him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Now there is the promise of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, All the Father gives me will come to me. And all those who come to me, I will not cast out. That means He will not reject you. He will not turn away from you. With open arms, He will receive you. And you will be saved from your sins. You could be the prodigal son this morning. You could become the prodigal daughter this morning. You could come to Jesus. And then you would know when you come to Him in your mind, in your heart, in your soul. Yes, Lord, I believe You died for me. I believe that I'm a sinner. And I believe that God laid my sins on Jesus. And I want to trust Him I want to receive Him today. Lord, save me from my sins. I close with this little illustration. You know, a thing cannot be taken away and yet left behind. If Jesus laid your sins, if God laid your sins upon Jesus, they're not on you. Because sin can't be in two places at the same time. And if God laid your sins on Jesus 2,000 years ago, they're not on you. And that's the good news He wants you to know this morning. The good news is that He laid your sins on Jesus 2,000 years ago. And this morning, you heard about it for the first time. And now you know who Jesus died for. He died for me. You can say that if you trust. Sin cannot be in two places at once. It cannot be on Jesus at the cross and on you at the same time. Were your sins laid on Christ? Isaiah saw it. 750 years before it happened. And with this little illustration I close. During the war, the civil war between the North and the South, they had a rule that if you could find a substitute, you wouldn't have to go to war. You could have that substitute go in your place under your name. And you would not be drafted into the army. And if a man had a wife and children, and they were dependent upon him, and he just couldn't bear the thought of leaving them behind with no one to take care of them. So he went and found another man. And said, would you take my place? I'll give you a great sum of money. Will you take my place? Will you go to battle? Under my name. And the man said, yes, I will. And so he went to battle, went into the army and fought. And unfortunately, he was killed. 
bearing the name of the man whose place he took. And when they came to this man to induct him into the army to fight in the war, he said, I've already been executed. I've already died. They said, what are you talking about? He said, my name is on the man who fell on the battlefield. He took my place. So I do not have to go. And they checked the records. And they found out it was true. This other man died in his place. So he didn't have to go into the army. Jesus took your place. So you wouldn't have to die and go to hell for your sins. What a wonderful Savior. What a wonderful love. That he would do that. For sinners like you and I. And today, you are faced with a choice. Would you believe on Him and trust Him? Would you be willing to receive Him? If you will, you may. If you can, you may. Trust Him today and be saved. Let's bow together in prayer. As we bow together in prayer, Brother Downs, would you dismiss us, please? Heavenly Father, we're thankful this morning for this clear presentation of the Lord Jesus Christ as our substitute. Lord, it's not what we do, it's what He has done. We come to believe that. But then we certainly can be assured that we're one of God's chosen one. Bless everyone that's here, those that haven't yet settled and made their peace with thee through the blood. I pray, Lord, they do it today. Thank you again for the message in Jesus' name. Amen.